Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our channel where we delve into the fascinating world of clinical trials. Today, we're going to explore a special type of trial that often raises more questions than it answers, the non-inferiority trial. Now, you might be wondering, why would we want a new treatment that's simply, not worse, than the existing one? Well, stick around, and you'll find out. Non-inferiority trials are considered reasonable when a new treatment has some property sufficiently favorable that physicians and patients would be willing to sacrifice some degree of benefit relative to an already approved therapy. This could be reduced cost, improved ease of use, simpler storage, or an improved safety profile. Non-inferiority trials are designed to show that a new treatment is not worse than an active control or standard treatment by more than a pre-specified small amount. But these trials are not as straightforward as they sound. There are unique challenges that come with non-inferiority trials. For instance, how do we decide the non-inferiority margin, which is the maximum allowable difference between treatments? What should be the primary population for analysis? And how do we ensure that the comparator treatment provides a fair fight? In an ideal world, the primary population for analysis in a non-inferiority trial should be the per-protocol population, which includes people who have taken their assigned treatment and adhered to it. But both the intention to treat and per-protocol populations are of interest to regulators. Another interesting concept in non-inferiority trials is bio-creep. This is where each successive product in a series of non-inferiority trials may be a little bit less effective than the previous product. It's like a game of telephone, but with medical treatments. Let's illustrate this with an example. Suppose we have a highly effective drug A that cures a particular disease in 90% of cases. A new drug B is developed, and a non-inferiority trial is conducted comparing B to A. The results show that drug B has an effectiveness of 89%, which is within the non-inferiority margin set for the trial. So, drug B is considered non-inferior to drug A now, a third drug C is developed. A non-inferiority trial is conducted comparing C to B, not A. The results show that drug C has an effectiveness of 88%, which is again within the non-inferiority margin set for the trial. So, drug C is considered non-inferior to drug B if this process continues over several generations of drugs, we could end up with a drug that is still considered non-inferior, according to the trials, but is significantly less effective than the original drug A. This is the phenomenon of biocreep. It's important to note that biocreep is a potential risk, not a certainty, in non-inferiority trials. It can be mitigated by careful trial design, including appropriate choice of the non-inferiority margin and the comparator treatment. The choice of the non-inferiority margin and how much of the existing treatment effect to preserve incorporates these other aspects of treatment, viability. It's a delicate balance that requires careful consideration. But remember, success in a non-inferiority trial depends upon success in the primary outcome measure, not on other aspects of benefit, such as safety. Regulatory success using non-inferiority trial designs may require completion of more than one such trial. So, it's a complex process, but one that can lead to significant advancements in treatment options. The CONSORT 2010 statement is a set of guidelines designed to improve the reporting of randomized trials. It has been extended specifically for non-inferiority and equivalence trials, which is what we're discussing today. One of the key recommendations is to clearly identify a study as a non-inferiority trial in the title and abstract. This helps readers quickly understand the nature of the study and makes it easier to include in systematic reviews. The abstract should be clear and detailed. It should specify the non-inferiority hypothesis, identify the primary outcome and non-inferiority margin, and clarify whether hypotheses for other reported outcomes are non-inferiority or superiority. The introduction should provide the rationale for using a non-inferiority design. This includes evidence for the efficacy of the reference treatment in a similar context and potential advantages of the new treatment over the reference treatment. The specific Let's take a moment to visualize what we've been discussing. These graphs represent different scenarios in a non-inferiority trial. The blue dashed line at x equals 0 indicates the non-inferiority margin, and the blue tinted region to the left of x equals 0 indicates the zone of inferiority. 
In this first scenario, if the confidence interval lies wholly to the left of zero, the new treatment is superior. In these scenarios, if the confidence interval lies to the left of the non-inferiority margin and includes zero, the new treatment is non-inferior but not shown to be superior. Here, if the confidence interval lies wholly to the left of the non-inferiority margin and wholly to the right of zero, the new treatment is non-inferior in the sense already defined but also inferior in the sense that a null treatment difference is excluded. This puzzling circumstance is rare, because it requires a very large sample size. It also can result from a non-inferiority margin that is too wide. In these scenarios, if the confidence interval includes the non-inferiority margin and zero, the difference is non-significant but the result regarding non-inferiority is inconclusive. Here, if the confidence interval includes the non-inferiority margin and is wholly to the right of zero, the difference is statistically significant but the result is inconclusive regarding possible inferiority of magnitude or worse. Finally, if the confidence interval is wholly above the non-inferiority margin, the new treatment is inferior. These visual representations help us understand the complex outcomes that can arise in non-inferiority trials. It's a reminder that while the goal of these trials is to show that a new treatment is, not worse, than an existing one, the reality can be much more nuanced. The Consort 2010 statement also provides a revised checklist for the reporting of non-inferiority trials. This checklist includes specific changes and extensions to cover reporting recommendations specific to the non-inferiority design. The pros and cons of non-inferiority trials are pros. 1. Ethical acceptability. The most significant advantage of a non-inferiority trial is that it is ethically acceptable to proceed with an active control group when there is clear evidence of efficacy for an existing standard treatment. It would be ethically unacceptable to proceed with a placebo or inactive control group in the evaluation of a new treatment for the same condition. 2. Potential superiority. While the superiority of the new treatment over active control would be an added advantage, the clear demonstration of non-inferiority in one or more specific criteria of patient response is the desirable goal which motivates such a trial. The new treatment could actually be superior to the active control treatment. Cons. 1. Risk of ineffective treatments. 2. Lacks an acceptance of non-inferiority trials, with a less than convincing active control treatment, could potentially lead to the adoption of more and more ineffective treatments. 2. False claims. All necessary steps need to be taken to ensure that any failings in the trial design, conduct, or analysis could not artificially dilute out any real treatment differences. That is, false claims of non-inferiority need to be avoided. 3. Compromise. Inevitably one can never prove that two treatments are identical, and hence some degree of compromise is always involved. Consider a non-inferiority trial comparing a new drug with omeprazole for treatment of Helicobacter pylori infection. The binary response is eradication of infection, yes or no. From past experience with omeprazole, an 85% eradication rate was anticipated. For trial planning, a non-inferiority margin was set at 15%. This means that the new drug would be regarded as non-inferior provided that the possibility of its eradication rate being 15% worse than omeprazole could be ruled out. The trial required 238 randomized patients. The observed eradication rates on the new drug and omeprazole were 86.5% and 85.3%, respectively. The 95% confidence interval for the treatment difference was minus 7.5% to plus 9.8%. A difference of minus 15% is clearly ruled out of consideration, and on that basis, the new drug was considered non-inferior to omeprazole. The example of a non-inferiority trial comparing a new drug with omeprazole for the treatment of Helicobacter pylori infection highlights the following pros and cons. Pros. Ethical considerations. The trial was designed in such a way that it did not deny patients a known effective treatment, omeprazole. Instead, it sought to determine if the new drug could achieve similar results. Potential for new effective treatments. The trial allowed for the possibility that the new drug could be as effective as the existing treatment, omeprazole, potentially providing another option for treating Helicobacter pylori infection. Cons. Uncertainty. 
non-inferiority trials inherently involve some degree of uncertainty. In this case, the trial could not definitively prove that the new drug and omeprazole were identical in efficacy. It could only show that the new drug was not inferior by a pre-specified margin. Choice of non-inferiority margin. The choice of the non-inferiority margin, 15% in this case, is critical and can be somewhat arbitrary. If set too wide, it could lead to the acceptance of a new treatment that is not much better than a placebo. In this case, the new drug was considered non-inferior to omeprazole, but this conclusion is dependent on the chosen non-inferiority margin. Sample size. Non-inferiority trials often require a large sample size to provide sufficient power to detect a difference between treatments, if one exists. In this example, 238 patients were required, which could be a limitation in terms of resources and time. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, stay curious, stay informed, and keep learning. And that's a wrap on our exploration of non-inferiority trials. It's a complex topic, but understanding it is crucial to making sense of many of the new treatments being developed. Remember, in the world of clinical trials, not worse, can sometimes be just as good. Until next time.